Hi, everyone again. Um, look, uh, our first speaker, um, uh, uh, keynote is going to be um, uh, given by um, Dave Watson. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dave to you. Dave's a professor, professor of ecology at Charles Sturt Uni, where he leads a group of researchers working at the interface between community ecology and landscape scale restoration. His research expertise is wide ranging from understanding the determinants of species diversity, mistletoe ecology and evolution and wildlife conservation in agricultural landscapes. And his talk today is titled Facilitating Recovery, Marshalling Food Web Dynamics and Engaging Landholders to Keep Our Woodlands Thriving. Very much looking forward to hear your talk, Dave. I'll hand it over to you. Lovely, thanks Sophie. Uh, let me just push a few buttons on my end. Uh, hopefully you can now see a screen with a mistletoe and babblers. Is that, is that right? Yes, we can. Ripper, all right. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Coming to you live from uh, from Wiradjuri uh, country, unceded Wiradjuri country, I might add. So uh, this is a bit of a rundown on some work that my group has been doing um, in in this neck of the woods uh, for the past uh, twenty years or so. Um, So it's, it's going to be focusing on these kinds of landscapes, landscapes that are hopefully familiar to many of you, uh, certainly landscapes that are familiar around here if I look out my window. Um, cropping country, grazing country, with some bush around. Uh, now it's, it's, it's a fairly polarizing kind of a landscape because if you're on a, if, if, you're, if you're walking through this, this area with um, some pretty strong-minded environmental people, they'd say, oh, look, it's flogged. Look at this, it's just bloody canola and cows, which is not really true. And if you are there with some, some landholders, they'd say, oh, look, there's heaps of bush. Yeah, just look, look, up, look up on the ridge there. So there's, it's, it, it's a landscape of contrasts. And I think I want to unpack some of those contrasts and show that there's, there's a middle ground there and you can have production uh, dominated landscapes, profitable um, landscapes, but also um, with space for the locals, for native vegetation, for all the wildlife that goes along with that, and all the really important ecosystem processes that those natural systems, um, uh, you know, support uh, that often feeds directly into profitable agriculture. So I think you know we do talk about win-wins uh, a fair bit, uh, you know, in my in my in my group. Uh, and that's not just pie in the sky naive thinking. That's that that's that's a reality. And I think it's something that many landholders are increasingly uh, aware of and striving to um to 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 incorporate better into their into their uh, their management practices. Now, in these landscapes, um, there's there's some issues. Um, there's a few uh, species that are hanging on in some of the higher. Uh, the rockier parts of the landscape, like that rock wallaby there, and some that are hanging on in those little pockets of productive vegetation on the valley floors in the woodlands, uh, like the curlew. Um, but the situation's changed a fair bit uh, in the last 100, 200 years. There's lots of critters here that weren't here uh, historically, uh, including predators. So things like cats, uh, things like foxes, are increasingly a big issue in many parts of the landscape. Uh, and there's a bit, bit of a problem with a lot of those invasive species is that there's only a set budget in many landscapes, whether it's at catchment management authority level at the individual national park level uh, to, to try and keep those numbers uh, down to a point um, where they're not driving things to extinction. But that's almost a fixed line item in budgets. So you've got this much money to do all of the things you're trying to do in your landscape with. And the best you can do currently with a lot of these ferals is just to stop them getting any worse. You spend a lot of money, you expend a lot of effort just to, to stand still effectively. And a lot of ecologists are saying, well, look, that's just silly. And there's got to be, there's got to be ways to do this more effectively that you can do go hard or try different things uh, in one go and then basically sort out the problem and then do other things with that money that you'd otherwise be frittering away year in, year out. And so that's the, that's the sort of promise of rewilding that you would have heard about. So many ecologists are really excited about that, about using native predators to beat up these invasive predators so you can spend your time and effort and money um, doing other things rather than doing the beating up of the cats and foxes and whatever else uh, you're, letting, you're letting predators do that instead. 
I've got colleagues who work in this space, very excited by the potential there, especially in uh, agricultural landscapes. I think there's a huge, huge potential there. Uh, my group is focused more on the little dudes. Uh, these things that are reasonably common in parts of the landscape still, um, but they're not doing too well. Uh, and there's, there's some genuine concern that as their ranges shrink, as their numbers decline, um, that we really need to start putting in place some measures now while there's still some, 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 some critters to, to, to work with before we sit back and go, oh yeah, I haven't seen one of those for, oof. actually I haven't seen one of those for quite a while. We don't wanna to get to that point. And I think there's a recognition there that we're only gonna do this if we work in partnership with landholders, landholder groups, catchments, um, rather than just working on the periphery in those little, those little bushy spots uh, tucked away in, in remnants. So that's sort of a promise of where we're going. And I, you'll note that I haven't put all these critters on top of the cows and, and the canola. I'm not coming from a place where I think it needs to be wildlife instead of agriculture. I think there's win-wins there uh, where you can have in the same landscape, often on the same property, um, you can do a lot of this stuff um, uh, in concert. So this next little 20 minutes or so, think of it like a tasting platter. Um, there's going to be, I'm going to touch on a whole range of different things that my group has been doing. Um, if that's of interest to you, great. You know, tuck in. Uh, if it's not really that important for you or you don't really see the relevance, just, you know, you can pass on that plate and there'll be more, more to follow. So let's start um, just by contextualizing things to make sure we're all on the same page here. Um, so this is vegetation, uh, what vegetation looked like in Australia um, when Europeans uh, first arrived. Now, please don't think that that's uh, vegetation that doesn't bear the mark of human management. We know increasingly uh, that humans have had a, a very important role in changing, modifying um, uh, landscape scale patterns, including vegetation for a very long time, tens of thousands of years. But this is the way it looked like uh, when we first got here. And I want you to focus on, on, on your part of the world, but also on the woodlands. So focus on the, um, these sorts of colors, the, um, the, the, the bottle green, uh, especially that's, that's you know, around here. And that's what it looks like now. So I'm just gonna oscillate between those two. So look at your landscape, look at you know, where, where your backyard is. That's what it was, you know, 200 years ago. That's what it's like now. There's a lot that's gone, okay? A lot. Uh, and we don't really pause and think about that as often as I think we should. And when I say we, I mean environmental scientists. Um, so the first take home message I wanna leave you with, and just take a moment to ponder this for your place, most woodland and most of the dependent critters, the individual critters that were frolicking in that woodland, they're gone. We're dealing with, with scraps. We're dealing with a few crumbs um, of what was once there. So there's good crumbs, there's some chunky ones, um, but it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a shadow of what it was up until very, really quite recently. Let's zoom in a bit more. This is Victoria. Um, and this is again, uh, pre, pre 1750 veg maps. And just have a look at these two, these two uh, rectangles here. Those are two, uh, two, two rectangles, both 200 by 100 Ks. So the northern one is probably where many of you are now. So that's, you know, there's, there's Bendigo, Shep, Echuca uh, in there. Um, in, in, uh, and, then, and then down here uh, to, the, uh, to the east of Melbourne, you know, we've got, we've got the mountains, uh, Mount Hotham, uh, Mansfield, that had a bit of a, bit of a shake lately, and Lake Yildon um, on the western boundary there. So look at those two squares. And that's what they look like now. Bit of a difference, eh? So what's missing? All this tealy stuff. What's that tealy stuff? It's woodland. So all of that is gone, has been converted primarily to agricultural land, some, some towns and, uh, and cities in there as well. Whereas a foresty country, the, uh, the topographically uh, yeah, up and down country, very little clearing has gone on there. There's been disturbance. There's been changes, uh, but a lot of the trees, a lot of the veg cover is still there. So, so please don't think that the clearing that's occurred has been sort of a bit, a bit here, a bit there, kind of patchy. It's been very, very targeted towards those productive landforms. So that's what I want to talk about now is productivity. If you're a farmer, you know about productivity. That's, that's what pays the bills. 
Um, and you know that there's parts of your property, parts of an entire uh, you know, catchment that are more productive and parts that are less productive. Um, and ecologists talk about this in terms of greenness. So you can see this from, as you fly over a landscape, you can see it from a satellite image. Um, and greenness, that's photosynthetic activity. That's a plant that's using light, that's using water, that's using nutrients and turning it into carbon. That's the basis of you know, terrestrial food webs. Um, and there's a gradient in productivity um, at all sorts of scales from, from um, if you get less water, if you get less nutrients, if you get less light, those three sort of raw materials, you're going to get less productivity. Now, what have we done to the place? We've cleared it pretty comprehensively, but that clearing has been disproportionately in that productive country, in the greenest country, where there's the deeper soils, where there's the, the, the higher fertility, the more reliable access to water. So that, that photo I shared with you at the start of the, of the, uh, of the, of the Herefords um, chomping away on the, on the lush grass with the bush in the background, that's where the bush is. That's the crappy country. That's the national parks, okay? Skeletal soils, rocky, high topography, lots of runoff. Whereas down here where the paddock was, chalk and cheese in terms of productivity, the amount of stuff you can grow down here with the same rainfall compared to up here is, you know, is, is astronomically different. And really here, this is the middle ground. This is where many of us sit. This is where many of us live, where many properties occur. And here is, I think, the great, where the greatest gains can occur. It's not on national parks. This is predominantly privately held uh, land. Um, there's still pockets uh, of native vegetation there. Uh, and I think the real challenge there is how can we sort of capitalize on the productivity that's there, divert some of it that's currently used for, for grain and for, for wool and for, for beef to, 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 to cockroaches and babblers uh, and, and, and orchids. You can't change that productivity too much, but you can divert it. So this is the second take home message. And again, it's something ecologists don't often talk about, that most woodland we've got left was originally marginal country for woodland dependent species. Yes, there is big chunks of woodland left in many catchments, but it's the crappy country, it's the rocky country, the stuff where many woodland dependent critters didn't really spend much time because there's not enough food, there's not enough water, there's not enough shelter. And we don't think about that very often. You might think of a bilby as a desert animal, it's not, it's a woodland animal. They're gone from the woodlands. They've been squeezed and pushed and, 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 and forced up to the dry red country, but they are actually a woodland animal. And there's many, many other examples of that where the current distribution kind of gives you a bit of a misleading understanding of where they'd rather be. Now, uh, the next speaker, David Eldridge, uh, has, forgot, uh, has forgotten more about soils than, than I'll ever know. So I'm not going to talk about this at length, but just bear in mind that everything we're talking about relates to soil. Um, and the soils that we see in woodlands now aren't the same as the soils when we first got here. And sheep are primarily the reason for that. There's been some very nice work looking at soil loss. Um, and we, we know that in the first 20, 30 years, uh, before there were towns, when squatters first moved in, so the 1830s, 1850s, um, the vast majority of the soil lost post-European settlement happened in those first 25, 30 years. We know this from, um, from dating uh, lake sediments, and that's, that's purely from, from hooves, from hard-hooved animals chopping up soil. There was cakey, loamy soil um, up on all the woodlands, um, and that, that, that disappeared. Um, as soon as um, as ungulates uh, arrived on the on the continent, um, and we're not getting that back. Um, you go to glaciers uh, in New Zealand, and you see those red streaks um, across them, and you think, "Oh, is that some interesting algae? Is that some weird life form?" No, no, that's red dust from outback New South Wales. That's topsoil. Most of the topsoil from southeastern Australia ended up in the Pacific, and a few bits ended up on some skinny little islands in the Pacific, including New Zealand. So a lot of that productivity that was there has left, has left the continent. So what are we going to do to remain profitable with agriculture? Well, you need to put some of those nutrients back. And you can't just grow soil, but you can throw nutrients down, the raw materials to get grass, to get cows, to get sheep. And so look at the inputs here. 
and just so notice that in many agricultural regions of Australia, we're effectively tripling nitrogen and doubling phosphorus available in the soil every year. That costs money and that comes from somewhere else. And we're putting it there to kind of use, use, use the soil almost like one giant hydroponic medium, chuck the nutrients in and then, and then let the plants do their thing. So I'm gonna zip through this, this food web, but just to make sure we're on the, on the same page, what we're talking about here is that is that the, this upper stuff is the uh, organic matter uh, in the soil, nutrients um, uh, in the soil, and then water. That powers everything you see outside your window, everything on your property. That's the that is the 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 foundation. Uh, and then as you move through and you think about the changes that have occurred in the last 150 to 200 years in your landscape, a lot of them revolve around these two cells here the microbial community that converts a lot of this stuff into living things um, further up the food web, and then the soil invertebrates. These little heroes are the guys that do the heavy lifting um, in soils and are the base of food webs for everything um, that you might see jumping around um, in the bush uh, when you go for a walk. And we're a bit worried um, about those insects. You might've seen some of these media reports, oh, apocalypse, where are all the bugs? When I was a kid, used to drive to, to you know to town, and there were there were splatters all over the windscreen. Not anymore. So there's genuine concern that this really important group of organisms that that convert leaf litter to humus, the the, the detritus eaters, the detritivores, aren't in nearly the numbers they were quite recently. And what does that mean for the rest of the food web? Um, well, that's one of the things we're trying to work out. And many of the many of the organisms in woodlands that are becoming rarer, that are shrinking to the north, uh, that are declining um, in some of our reserves, they're insectivores. They eat bugs, and they don't just eat any old bugs. They don't spend much time up in the canopy of trees. They eat bugs on the on the canopy floor, on on, on the woodland floor in the little layer. Um, and so if you think about, about, about what we've done to woodlands from an insectivore's point of view, from a tree creeper's point of view, we've gone from this quite complicated system with big trees, the occasional shrub, plenty of fallen timber on the ground to a much more simplified uh, landscape where the trees might be there, the big ones aren't necessarily there anymore. And we've piled up a lot of the dead ones into these big piles that we might burn to, uh, to clean up the place now and then. So from a from an insect's point of view, from a, a cockroach's point of view, from a babbler's point of view, uh, that's that's a high-rise building. You could you could you could build a community there, but that's that might as well be Mars. So litter bugs, insects in leaf litter really matter. They're the krill of woodlands. They're the early, right, right at the base of the, of, the, of, of the food web that powers everything further up. You might think of cockroaches as, as kind of gross in your kitchen, but out in the bush, that's, um, that's a tasty snack for a whole lot of critters, as well as performing many important functions in its own right, including building soil. Um, so I'm not gonna bang on too hard about mistletoes. Um, but just understand that I can I can talk under wet concrete about mistletoe. So this is this is really the the distillation. This is a little shot. Um, I've done some work on mistletoes in woodlands um, in the Billabong Creek catchment just around Holbrook there, and took a bunch of mistletoes, took all the mistletoes away from twenty woodlands on private land on farms, and left uh, mistletoes alone uh, on twenty other woodlands, and then looked at how things changed through time. Uh, and we see that, so, so these are the color coded here. The red uh, is, is where I left mistletoe alone. The blue are those woodlands where I removed all the mistletoe. And within three years, we lost about a third of our birds. A third of all the birds in that whole system were just gone. And that pattern was driven by insectivores. Once you took insectivores out of the mix and looked at everything else, there was no difference between sites with and without mistletoe. And you drill down a little further and you think, okay, well, what kind of insectivores? It's the ground foragers, it's the robins, it's the babblers. They're the ones driving this pattern. And it's like, well, that's a bit of a weird thing. You're just mucking around with this plant in the canopy and these birds down in the forest floor, the woodland uh, you know, flora are gone. They don't even spend time in, in, uh, in mistletoe. What's that all about? And so uh, we're finding out more and more 
about the mechanisms driving these kinds of patterns and the interactions that are important. So you might think of mistletoe as a bit of a weed, something that's not very good, something that's from Europe. Well, that's all not quite right. It's a native plant. Um, there's, there's, they're, they're not introduced and they rely on animals for all sorts of different interactions, including pollination, including seed dispersal, but there's many other interactions that go on as well. Oh, I just bumped that, made that over. And leaf litter. Leaf litter is super important. Mistletoes churn through their leaves. Your average eucalypt or acacia is a miser. It grows its leaves very slowly. It hangs onto them for years and defends them with all sorts of nasties. So that when, even when they fall down, they take a very long time to decompose. Mistletoe, it's a live fast, die young kind of plant. It's a parasite. It didn't invest to, 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 to work hard to get that, uh, those nutrients or that, uh, that water. It just slurped it out of the, uh, the red gum. And so it drops its leaves full of goodies they decompose rapidly and they cause the surrounding host litter to decompose rapidly as well. And so when you add mistletoe, um, oh, it keeps moving. When you add mistletoe litter um, to, to woodlands, you get more bugs, way more bugs. So we've done this experimental work. Um, the detail really doesn't matter here, but under mistletoe, you get more bugs, especially the bugs that insectivores like to eat. Um, and so looking at what a mistletoe does to a, to a woodland, there's direct effects that you get from the mistletoe itself. Um, so more litter, more microbes, um, and uh, increased biodiversity um, below that. And soil moisture can sometimes decrease because you, the, the, the plant's a bit thirstier. Um, but then once you add animals to that equation and think not just of plant plant interactions, but what about these visiting animals, you're getting all sorts of other things going on. So at the start, I mentioned that there's this big nutrient subsidy that's going on in many agricultural environments. We're moving nitrogen and phosphorus from often marine derived uh, deposits to, 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 to continental areas, to farms. That's called a nutrient subsidy. There's tiny, small scale, like 500 meter, 50 meter, uh, nutrient subsidies going on, um, mediated by animals moving things around. So when a bird comes to nest in a mistletoe in a paddock tree, it craps a lot. It coughs up pellets a lot from nutrients gathered across a much wider landscape. So that, that leads to a little pulse in resource availability of potassium, of calcium, uh, phosphorus, all sorts of animal derived nutrients that, that soils are quite depauperate from. So that has a real boosting effect. It's like a catalyst that just, just, just supercharges um, understory plants, soil, microbial communities, therefore more bugs, therefore more insectivores. So we're finding these really complicated feedback loops uh, mediated by leaf litter and the insects that are dwelling within leaf litter. So final take home message, uh, mistletoe. It matters, it matters surprisingly. Um, and it's, it's an example of just how critical the production and the retention of organic matter is uh, in woodlands as much as it is in production systems. So finalize, uh, just, just wrapping things up here. Um, I'd encourage you all to, to challenge, to challenge the status quo, just because it's always been done that way doesn't mean that way is the right way. You know that the climate now is different to the climate when you were born, and it sure as hell is gonna be different um, when, you know, in another 40, 50, 60 years. Um, so I just wanna pick up on a few, a few words that I used. Um, so tidying up, tidying up is a concept that you, you hear a lot with, with some, some farmers. Um, and that, that, you know, what I call uh, my habitat rich garden, my narky neighbors call messy. Um, and what an ecologist calls coarse woody debris, where you find bearded dragons, where you find curlews nesting on properties. Uh, well, a pest animal guy would call, oh, that, that's a harbour. That's a harbour for pests. No, you want to clear that up. We're talking about the same stuff. We're just using different language. Um, so be aware of, 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 of these, this sort of doublespeak. Remember, mistletoe, good stuff. Um, and when you're, when you're thinking about your property and the native vegetation on your property, you might be thinking big picture. You might be thinking about connectivity. You might be thinking about linking up the patches on your place. And you might be thinking about linking up your place with that big chunk of bush uh, up, the, up the road. Great, do that. And that might involve revegetation. And when you're talking about reveg, when you're putting trees in the ground, don't just think about the tree, the green bit, 
think about the brown stuff, think about litter. And some trees are factories of litter. So casuarinas, some of the acacias, and then these other weird things, the parasites, uh, cherry ballards, exocarpus, quandongs, the, 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 one of the native sandalwoods. They're really important generators of litter. And they're these magnets for other animals that bring in goodies from further afield, microbes, nutrients, seeds. And uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of the work we've done is, is demonstrating these patterns with birds, uh, but this is not just a bird thing. This is an insectivore thing. Uh, and there's many insectivores in our landscapes that we're concerned about, that this sort of thinking will really help. So dragons, legless lizards, bats, um, and those little uh, marsupial mice, the donuts. Uh, if you want more information about this sort of stuff that I've touched on, uh, this is my website. Uh, all my papers are, 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 um, are free to read there. There's a very handy book that I'll give a plug for from CSIRO uh, Publishing that puts a lot of this stuff in a broader context, quite accessible language too. So if this, if what I've mentioned is, is of interest and you want more, um, track this book down and there's some really worthwhile stuff in there. I, I'd encourage you to have a look at it. Uh, and I think that's, that's my time. So I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you very much. We had lots of good questions coming in um, on top of that presentation. So we'll make sure to get to those um, in a little bit. Um, Sophie, I might hand back to you to introduce um, Professor Eldridge. Um, thanks, Sash, and, and thanks, Dave, for that fabulous talk. Um, lots of questions there. Um, but we'll, we're going to um, put these talks together and, and then get to the questions at the end, as Sasha said. Um, so, look, yes, yeah, so I'd like to introduce you to our next speaker, who is um, Professor David Eldridge. Um, he's a professor at the School of Biological Earth and Environmental Sciences at Uni, Uni, Uni of New South Wales. Um, he's more than 40 years' experience in rangeland management and assessment and the ecology of dry land systems. Um, he's the editor of the Journal of Arid Environments and Restoration Ecology and has published over 250 papers in international journals. Um, and over the past decade, David's research has focused on the effects of grazing on ecological processes, shrub encroachment, animal effects on soils um, and the ecology and the management of biological soil crusts. And his talk today is titled, Harnessing the Activity of Soil Disturbing Animals to Restore Degraded Woodlands. Uh, welcome, Dave, and thanks for coming and joining us. Looking forward to your talk. Thanks very much. Um, it's uh, it's great to be able to talk to such a fantastic group of people and to be the third David to be talking in one day. Amazing. Um, I'm coming to you from um, Bidjigal and Gadigal country. Uh, I'm just trying to work out how my to start my video. You cannot start your video because the host has stopped it apparently. Um, oh, sorry. So maybe you could maybe you could put my video on. I think you should have just received a notification to turn it back on. Uh, okay. uh, perfect. Thank you. So where are we? I can still. Okay. Okay. So can you see my screen now? Yes. Everything Fantastic. looks ready to go. Okay, great. Um, that was a great presentation, David. And David Tongway's presentation was absolutely, they were, they've all been fantastic. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today. And when the organisers asked me to talk about in the context of leakage, I thought, how the hell am I going to talk about leakage? Most of what I'm talking about is about ecosystem function. And then I thought, well, these organisms that I'm working on, they're kind of like, they're pluggers. They're plugging the leakage. Um, I'm going to be talking today about native animals and why they're really important for restoring degraded ecosystems. And many of the things that these animals do actually plug the leakage. They stop the water flow. They stop the nutrient loss. Um, they conserve um, uh, habitat. So that's kind of the context of the, of the presentation I'll be giving today. Um, David has... has uh, uh, David Watson has just told us that there's a few crumbs left. Um, there are a few crumbs left. We've got some bilbies and betongs, but really Australia has had a terrible history of its native mammals. And you know, over the last 230 years, the ranges have restricted. And, and you're right, David, that the bilbies used to occur right along the coast. And now where are they? They're stuck in little fenced reserves on offshore islands, or way in the arid zone where conditions are not really that favorable. And that's because they've been 
predated on by cats and foxes. But let's not forget habitat fragmentation, land clearing, the sorts of things that early Europeans brought to this country quite ignorantly, um, trying to convert it into a, an environment that they had back home. Um, many of you would have heard about the concept of ecosystem engineers. An ecosystem engineer is an organism that uh, changes its habitat, changes the soil without actually consuming it. So they create habitat for other animals. Um, they enhance water flow. They do a whole bunch of different things. A, uh, a mistletoe is an ecosystem engineer. It's a really important ecosystem engineer. Um, unfortunately, everything pretty much is an engineer. Even a little hole in a tree is an engineer where it captures a bit of water and provides a pool of water for some invertebrate. Um, but the ecosystem engineers that I wanted to talk about today are those that dig in the soil. And we still have a few left in Australia. We have on the left-hand side here, we have the echidna, which is quite cute and cuddly. Uh, we have some betongs and of course we have goannas. And uh, there's a photo of my dog. She's also an ecosystem engineer, but uh, we won't be talking about her today. Um, if we think about what these ecosystem engineers do, and I don't want to dwell on the detail of this, um, one of my colleagues called it a spaghetti diagram. Um, they have lots of different effects. They dig a hole. So when they're digging a hole, they create two structures. They create the hole and they create a mound, an area that, that's made up of the soil that comes out of the hole. And these, this mound and pit have amazing impacts on soils. They have effects on water and sediment, on the capture of litter, on the capture of seed. That affects habitat, that affects nutrients, that affects plants influences runoff and erosion, and even influences soil development. Australia, this, the, the rate of soil formation in Australia is extremely low. I've, I've, heard, the, I've heard them say that um, about one centimetre every thousand years. So really we are losing soil at an exponential rate much higher than what we are forming it, uh, it unless you're of course in a, um, in a tropical forest. So these ecosystem engineers, these soil disturbing animals have major impacts on a whole range of biota. And there's a whole bunch of feedback processes as well. One thing affects another. It doesn't happen in isolation. And if we look at some of the animals in Australia that, have, uh, that are important soil disturbing animals and look at how much soil they move, the, the research is showing that it's quite substantial. Um, at the bottom here, we have this orange line showing that the European rabbit and the wombat move, you know, almost a hundred tons per hectare of soil in their lifetime. Um, that's by creating mounds, uh, which are the above ground structures of these of their, of their colonies. If we think about superb lyrebirds, it's even more, something up to 200 tonnes per hectare of soil. This is pretty amazing. You cannot move that much soil without having a major effect on ecosystem function and on ecosystem processes and, and on the biota that um, occur in our ecosystems. Now, why am I interested in echidnas? Because I wanna talk about specifically about echidnas and how they might be useful for us in restoring degraded woodland soils. Well, unlike the bilby and the betong and the stick nest rat and all those other suite of small critical weight range animals, we still have a lot of echidnas left. There's a lot of them, they're all over the place. And this was a survey that my colleague Dan Lunny did, oh, I was gonna say a couple of years ago, but it was probably 10 years ago now, where he mailed, um, he sent out mailing um, uh, questionnaires to people all over the state, asking them what sort of animals they'd seen. He actually got some, some funny replies. If I see any animals on my place, I'm gonna shoot them. Um, there were lots of uh, weird responses, but one of the animals that was most widely distributed in his um, questionnaire was the echidna. 
And you can see it occurs from everywhere, from the alpine areas to the arid zone to the north coast. It's ubiquitous. And it's really important because it digs holes. And this is what it does to the soil. It digs up all that soil. And you'd look at that soil and you'd think, my God, that can't be good for the landscape. Look, there's that beautiful biological crust in the background. Um, I know Cassia, you're listening in there. I saw your name on the list of participants. You can see those beautiful lichens and mosses in the background. And the echidnas have dug all that up and created this really messy surface. Why is that important? Why, how is that going to affect our system and how can we use that to restore degraded systems? Here we have a couple of pits. They're not pits of echidnas, although they look very similar to pits of echidnas. They are the pits that have been created by a machine called a tine pitter. Now, I'm not sure if David Tongway is still listening in, but in his book that he showed us at the end of his presentation, he talked about tine pitting as a history of failure, to quote his words. Um, and it was a history of failure. I analysed a series of experiments in Western New South Wales when I worked for the Soil Conservation Service of tine pitting all around the country. And it's very effective. The little pits that are created by a tractor, there are, for, for the farmer types out there, there are two tines at the front and a, and a tine at the back in between them. So like a triangle shape, they go up and down like a cam and they go into the soil and create this series of furrows and intervening areas. The, the, the principle behind the effectiveness of these pits is that they, water is captured between the pits, it runs off into these pits. It stops water running off, it stops leakage. So these pits are very effective, but they're very short lived and eventually um, they, they break down and, then, and we use more effective restoration techniques now. But essentially what we have done is we have mimicked in this restoration technique, we have mimicked the natural foraging pits created by animals to create this restoration technique. I would like to, now to take you to Central West, well, Central West New South Wales, a center, right in the center of New South Wales, a place called Yathong Nature Reserve. Now you might look at that photo and uh, that's pretty depressing. Uh, it, was, it was in a drought, um, some beautiful eucalypts, but this particular part of the nature reserve had very little ground story vegetation. We set up an experiment where, I'm gonna to go to the next one. We go set up an experiment where we um, mimicked artificially the pits created by echidnas so that we could measure a whole bunch of ecological um, attributes. And we could look at whether these, the activity of echidnas was useful for restoring degraded systems. Um, so we measured them over 18 months. We looked at the rate of fill, infilling of the pit. We looked at litter and seed capture. We looked at infiltration. We looked at decomposition and we looked at carbon as a measure of function. And many of the things we looked at were related to the soil because I'm into soil. Um, so, and, uh, and we thought that um, if these organisms are having an effect on the soil, then that's going to flow on to other biota. I'll just go back to the previous one to show you that unlike the tine pitter, that machine with the regular pits, echidnas don't dig in a regular fashion. This rectangle here represents a plot of four meters by 50 meters, where we measured three, four times a year for three years, the location and size of every echidna pit that was dug uh, on this property called Scotia, which is halfway between Mildura and Broken Hill. And this is a, the, a map of the distribution over the three years. And you can see here that there's a concentration of digging by echidnas in the middle here. And that's because they tend to focus on the roots of trees. They tend to focus on shrubs rather than the interspaces. Anyway, 
what sort of results do we get from our echidna experiment? Well, the first huge result was that you get more litter in a pit than you get in the adjacent surface. And, and, and I'm really pleased that David uh, Watson brought this up, the, the importance of litter, because litter drives these systems. Litter contain all the carbon, and we want to get the carbon in the soil. And what's the echidna doing? The echidna is digging a pit that's catching litter. Something like five times the amount of litter was in the pits than in the adjacent area of a comparable size of, uh, of, of a comparable size as the pit. So we're getting more litter. We're also getting a more spatially distributed litter. This is a plot of 30 by 30 meters where we did some fancy statistics and looked at the distribution of hotspots of litter. And here are all the hotspots of litter. These patches here, these little patches with red, and they correspond in many cases to these aggregations of pits that echidnas have dug over many years. And that's where all the litter is. And I guarantee that's where all the carbon and all the microbes are as well. We looked at how quickly pits uh, declined over time and they're catching litter, they're catching seed, and generally, they tend to disappear after about 18 months to two years. And you might think, well, that's pretty hopeless for a restoration technique. We want them to stick around for longer. Well, what we want them to do is to catch litter and water and soil and seed and sediment. And then we want them to trap all that material. And the only way they can do that is to accrete, is for more material to come in. So it's actually a good thing. And these pits are actually collecting all this material. And after about two years, unless you know exactly where the pit is, you can't really tell where the pit has been uh, anymore. Um, we know that there's greater decomposition of litter in the pits. Just, this is a bit complicated, but just concentrate on these two points here after 18 months. This uh, pinkish point, I guess it's pink, um, is the surface and the two points above it are two different types of pits. One where, we, uh, one where we dug a pit on its own and another one where we dug it and put a little bit of soil in it. Um, but essentially we're getting a greater decomposition. Why might that be? Well, if you put litter on the ground and you don't put soil on top of it, it gets broken down by ultraviolet light. All that carbon is lost to the atmosphere is CO2. We don't want that. We want our carbon in the soil. So when you put litter and soil and litter and soil, it brings the litter into contact with microbes, into contact with fungi that are the primary, that are the first, they're the first guys that get out there and break down that recalcitrant litter, that litter with um, lots of toxic um, compounds in it. In, in our case, we use eucalypt litter and eucalypts have a lot of weird phenols and things that are quite hard to break down. So litter is breaking down faster in the pit. We found, not surprisingly, that if you're getting more litter, you're getting more seeds. And I've cheated a little bit. This is not a study. The, the, this uh, glasshouse experiment was not a study of um, um, echidna pits. It was a study of betong and bilby pits. But essentially, we're still getting many, many seeds, more seeds coming up in the pits than we would in the adjacent areas. We also find that uh, pits are collecting more germinants, more plants are coming up in the pit, more plants are germinating, a greater number of plants, something like three times more, that graph, uh, graph on the left hand side, Three times more plants are found germinating in the pits and more than twice the number of species. So we're getting a richer plant community and we're getting more plants in these foraging pits. They sound too good to be true, don't they? Um, they're also getting more water. They're preventing leakage. And it doesn't really matter whether you're under the canopy of a tree, you're getting about two and a half times more water going through the pit of an echidna than you are uh, on the, in the natural surface, or if you're out in the open. Um, and that's that little, little uh, 
cluster of um, histic um, bar graphs just there on the right hand side. So we're getting more water into the soil. Now, um, a very enterprising student of mine back in 2009, it was, uh, was stuck out in the field after an inch of rain. And she said, well, I wonder if, I wonder if these echidna pits are keeping water, uh, are catching water more, more readily than non-pits. So she measured soil moisture. You can see here a day after 22 millimetres of rain is about 40% moisture, which is pretty damn high compared to about 6% on the surface. And that persisted right out here to five days after rainfall. Still very high levels of, um, of water uh, soil moisture, about 11% compared to very, very low levels. Um, and I expect that that would have persisted for many weeks after that. So more water and greater retention. Now, this is not the best bit of equipment that my agency owns, but it is a rainfall simulator. And it did provide us with an opportunity to study exactly how the foraging pits of echidnas might trap overland flow and runoff and prevent leakage or retain resources in some of these woodland systems. This is a place called Yathong Nature Reserve, which some of you may have been to. It's in uh, just uh, halfway between Cobar and, it's halfway between Cobar and Hilston. So it's in central, uh, Western New South Wales. So again, we artificially constructed echidna pits. Um, and why would I do that rather than use ordinary pits? because we want to make sure all the pits are the same. We want to make sure they're all in the same place. We want to make sure they're not there. There's no other underlying differences that might cause the effect. As scientists, as reductionists in general, we want to try and reduce all that extra variability. So what we did is we constructed pits um, quite well, I, th I thought. And you know, after measuring thousands of echidna pits, I'm pretty sure I know what they look like now. And I've got a little device that I can run through the soil and I can create this amazing pit. So what we showed was that using that rainfall simulator at a rate of 50 millimeters an hour, two inches an hour, that we actually were able to reduce the rate, the time, sorry, at which runoff starts to commence on these soils. So Runoff commences on these soils at about three millimetres, uh, sorry, uh, at about, uh, what's that, one into five, six minutes on a, um, on a soil without pits. And as soon as you put pits on the soil and do a runoff experiment, the runoff is actually, um, the onset of runoff is prevented. In other words, these pits create a reservoir of water that remains in situ and does not run off. So it traps that water in place. The other really interesting thing about this study is that we, uh, I had a young student who was uh, into art and we collected a thousand seeds of acacia. No, it wasn't acacia, Dodonia viscosa. And she painted on those seeds a whole lot of different colored dots, took her ages. And we arranged the seeds on these plots at various positions, some we put some we put in the in, right inside the pits here, some we put here, we put them everywhere. We simulated rainfall and then we collected the seeds uh, before the ants would took, took them and we worked out where the seeds had actually gone. Not surprisingly, seeds that started in a pit ended up in a pit. Seeds that started on the surface ended up in a pit. So most of the seeds, something like 90% of the seeds that we placed in these plots ended up in a pit. So what echidnas are doing is they are coupling, they are bringing together water. They are, sorry, they're not bringing together. They are allowing seeds and water to come together in a microsite that gives those seeds a competitive advantage. And we're gonna see some uh, evidence of that shortly. Um, pits were also habitat for microarthropods. And I'm just really pleased to, to see Dave Watson uh, talk about the importance of arthropods and the fact that we don't have to clean our windows when we drive in the country much anymore. Um, very alarming, actually. Um, 
it's uh, it's it's one of the one of the big global problems that we're having to deal with. Um, when we extracted soil from the pits of echidnas, we found that we had um, a greater number of groups, something like 30% more broad groups. In other words, um, you know, broad taxa like springtails and nematodes and things like that. But we also had three times the abundance. So we're getting many more invertebrates or arthro microarthropods in these pits than we do on the adjacent soil. Um, I probably um, have already alluded to this, but if you're getting more decomposition and you're getting more litter capture and you're getting more arthropods and differences in temperature, which I didn't show you, you're going to get different amounts of nutrients. And so nutrient levels, in this case, carbon, are almost twice as much in, uh, in dune systems. In a swale, they're almost uh, two and a half times and twice in an interdune system. So we are increasing the levels of carbon in our soil by promoting or allowing these animals to dig these foraging pits. Um, you can see the scale along the y-axis, 1% carbon. Absolutely pathetic levels of carbon in Australian soils. If I was to go and fly to, if I were allowed to fly, um, if I was allowed to fly to um, uh, Texas or Nevada next week and hop out of a plane and dig a hole, I'd find that the carbon levels in the, the soils there in a comparable semi-arid environment would probably be five times that. So Australian soils are pathetically low in carbon and that's why any increase in carbon in our soils is critically important. So to me, this slide is probably pulls it all together. And this was some work that one of my students uh, did looking at taking intact cores, just checking time, Sophie, I think I'm okay. Um, taking intact cores from the pits of echidnas and comparing them with the soil adjacent to the pit. And we collected a whole bunch of intact cores, half of them from a pit, half of them from the surface, and we subjected them to two treatments. One lot, we gave them a high water treatment, and the other lot, we gave them a very, very low water treatment. Um, so we ended up with essentially four treatments. Pit soil, high water, pit soil, low water, non-pit soil, high water, non-pit soil, low water. And we did this work in a, a growth chamber, and we grew a plant that this plant is called Dactolic. Dactyloctinium radulans, because it's, it's easy to grow and it's a native and it grows pretty quickly. And what do we find? What do we find after 65 days? Well, not surprisingly, the plants that were growing in the pit soil with lots of water had the highest production. Here they are over here. And also not surprisingly, the, the plants that were growing in the pits with the very low water have the lowest production. That makes sense. But the thing that really gobsmacked me was the fact that we got very similar production from, a, from pit soil with very, very low water or surface soil with very, very high water. So what pits are doing is that they're compensating for the low moisture in adjacent soils. And you're going to get the same sort of production in a foraging pit with very little water that you would get in an unvegetated soil with very high water. That was pretty amazing. So just kind of to put it into perspective and bring us back to the sorts of woodland systems that most of you will be familiar with coming from Victoria. Um, this is a, a, a study we did in, in um, just, uh, near Mildura, and, no, no, was it in Mildura? I can't remember anyway. Um, it was in a woodland system, looking at how, looking at the activity of echidnas in a functional system on the left-hand side. When I say functional, I mean a, a system with a lot of overstory, a lot of ground story, um, fantastic perennial grasses, lots of fallen timber, coarse woody debris, and right across the fence, 
a system that's tidy, a tidy system um, with, sure, there were a lot of trees, but there weren't many shrubs, a few grasses, not much coarse woody debris because the farmer had uh, raked all the wood up, wood up, burnt it to keep the place looking good. What did we find? We found almost 14,000 foraging pits of echidnas in the functional system on the left-hand side. And that compares with a little over 200 pits per hectare on the right-hand side. And when you measure the pits and you look at the amount of soil they're moving, they're moving something like 18 tonnes of soil per hectare on the left and only one tonne of soil on the right. A huge difference. But we also compared the average size of pits. The average size of pits is three times greater on the right-hand side than the left-hand side. Why would that be? Well, these poor echidnas on the right are forced to dig harder. We know when times are tough and ants, uh, the diversity of ants is very low, echidnas switch to eating termites. In fact, they prefer to eat ants, but they will eat termites and they have to dig deeper. So they have to dig much, much deeper to access these termite colonies. And as a result, you end up with a pit that's much, much greater. And then I thought, started thinking about this and I started thinking about the evolutionary consequences of this. Maybe they're digging deeper in these, dis, in these uh, dysfunctional systems. Maybe that has some evolutionary consequence or maybe it has a management consequence. It's a bigger pit. It's gonna catch more litter. It's gonna catch more seed. It's gonna get more water. And that system is going to be kick-started. So um, the advantages of having echidnas on the right-hand side is that they're going to be bigging these big pits that are hopefully over time, given correct management, are going to kick-start the system and bring back those sorts of things that have been lost that are apparent on the left-hand side. Um, so I just want to really, I mean, the purpose of this presentation uh, was really just to raise the importance of these animals and all the other animals that dig in the soil for that matter. And, uh, and it's to share with you a good news story about why these animals are important. And they're important for restoring habitat patches. What can we do to protect them? Um, as David said, David Watson said, um, we are stuck with these production systems and these natural systems. Well, we're not going to get rid of grazing. Um, I'd like to get rid of horses, but that's another story and that's probably for another day. But we're never going to get rid of grazing because we rely on grazing it's socially and politically and, um, and we eat meat. Um, so we have to learn to live in this system. So, But what we can do to help these echidnas is to maintain habitat connectivity and control feral animals. And the usual, these are the usual suite of objectives that we have in any systems. So I'm, I'm going to leave it there. And, but, you know, this wasn't my work. I did some of it. I led some of it, but I had a fantastic group of students that helped. Thanks. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Professor Eldridge. I thought it was particularly interesting looking at the left and right comparison over the fence. I thought that was really interesting. So thank you so much for that whole presentation. Thank you. Um, perfect. So we're going to um, go to some audience questions now. Um, we've got quite a lot in the chat already. Um, so I'm going to start there. Um, Paul, your first question to Dave Watson. Do you want to ask that directly? Uh, yeah, thanks, Dave. Look, fantastic presentation. I really enjoyed both of them a lot. Um, look, I just wanted to make the point, I, I totally agree with you about the, the, the asymmetric nature of clearing and that the uplands, which are the less productive country, <coughs> have been largely left, both on private and public land. But I also uh, you know, have the view that um, even those upland areas uh, are often wanting and they've been degraded and, and often in poor condition. And there is merit, I would, I would argue, in the big conservation equation to try and improve the health of those uplands as well as doing more work on on the cleared farmland areas yeah look agreed um i guess it's just a, a reminder that um you, you're fighting the forces of nature and trying to get them um to a point where they're going to replace uh the productive country um on the on the valley floors and i guess a, 
a really worthwhile <coughs> uh, anecdote is uh, you probably, many of you are well aware of the region honey eater. Uh, it's quite mm. rare, uh, it's getting rarer. Um, so I live maybe 20 minutes from, from Jelton and there's one single iron bark that lives, that's on the outskirts of town on the, on the flat country. Um, it's a big tree uh, and it's, it flowers more regularly and supports more region honey eaters. That single tree than the entire national park most years because the national parks, you know, it was mined. It's, it's on that rockier country. Um, so, so just understand that, that um, a, chunk of, a chunk of bush uh, on the flat is just is worth its weight in pickled onions. And yes, I agree with you, Paul, the bush we've got left on the ridges, on the rocky country, in the, in the higher landforms, it does have a role. It is important. Um, but just understand that it's never going to be providing those, 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 those recruits, those, those thriving populations that we're going to need um, to repopulate landscapes. We, we do need to work with um, um, the, even, even, even single trees sometimes uh, in, that, in that higher productivity landforms. Totally agree. Thank you. Another question for you, Dave Watson. Uh, this is from Peter Mitchell, who says many local trees have dead mistletoe only. I don't know where local is to him, where he's specifying me saying what is happening there. Can you shed any light? Yeah, look, thank you for the question. And uh, this is this is something that I've noticed as well in, in my travels. Um, it's it's almost certainly heat uh, rather than drought. Um, so mistletoes are weird plants. They've got no roots and they've also got no storage organs. So they rely on regular, regular, regular slurps from their host. If their host gets water stressed, mistletoes will often keel over. But um, because their, their leaf tissues are so full of water, if it gets very hot, especially if it stays hot during nighttime, when there's a different kind of, uh, a different set of chemical reactions that occur that need lower temperatures, um, we've got anecdotal, just anecdotal evidence that mistletoes just curl up their toes. This is even out in the Streslecky Desert. So I've got, I've got um, ridges of uh, dunes of mulga that I've been studying for the past 21 years. All the mistletoes there died um, in the last two summers. Um, and I don't think that's from lack of water. I'm pretty sure that's a heat thing. Um, so I'm looking at this now. I've got colleagues uh, looking at this in Hunter Valley. Um, and I've got colleagues in Chile looking at this in temperate forests in South America. Um, it's 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 I think what you're seeing is 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 the effects of, of extreme extreme temperature. Wow. Thank you for your question, Peter, and your answer, Dave. I've got just one more for you, Dave. Um, so from Francine Noble asks, um, you know, wonderful presentation, great information to back up, not tidying up, dropped matter. Regarding the importance of mistletoe, would be really interested to hear your thoughts on why a lot of the yellow box in the Tambo Valley in Gippsland area are being Im adversely impacted by mistletoe. She says the number of mistletoe plants on each tree are high and the trees are in a steady state of decline. Other types of eucalypts either don't appear to have mistletoe or they, or if they do, they only have one or two plants. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, and that's, that's something I've seen in other landscapes as well, in the Riverland of South, South Australia. Uh, and around Wagga, you see, you see yellow box, um, Eucalyptus miliodora is a favorite host for a couple of different species, especially box mistletoe. Um, so what you're seeing there is a symptom um, of, of a system where there's, it's, it's a bit out of whack. So recall that a yellow box would normally be in a woodland surrounded by other trees. Um, and mistletoes, are, they're limited in, South, in so Southeastern Australia. There's, there's two main factors um, that, that, that limits mistletoe populations. There's the occasional fire coming through. Mistletoes have no real resistance to fire. So even a low level burn comes through, crisps up their leaves, they're gone. Um, and also possums. There's insect herbivores as well, um, but brush tail possums, um, mistletoe is one of their top, top, top favorite plants. And if you think about what we've done to, to many uh, landscapes, the hollow bearing trees aren't there. The understory plants aren't there. There's foxes running around at night. Um, and then there was broad scale rabbit baiting with pindone uh, laced carrots. All these things really hit possums hard. Um, so take away 
those hungry mouths chomping on mistletoe every night and then take away these small scale fires that used to occur throughout these landscapes. And you see, especially in paddock trees and trees on the edges of woodlands, they're just not getting um, that, that, that backward, that downward pressure from those natural enemies and they're growing, growing, growing. Um, so it's, I, I think that what you're seeing is not to do with the birds moving the seeds around. I think their numbers and their behavior hasn't changed that much. It's to do with fire and it's to do with herbivores, especially possums. And so to turn that around um, is tricky. Um, the odd fire now and then is a useful management tool. Nest boxes are also a really useful sort of short term um, uh, option, but really trying to exclude um, stock um, from some areas to allow some understory to come back in. Um, some of the nectar bearing shrubs like Berseria, native blackthorn, a few other species as well, important nectar producers for butterflies and butterflies that lay their eggs in mistletoe, the larvae eat mistletoe. So restoring some of that balance and recognizing that when you're seeing lots of mistletoes in trees, that's telling you that something's out of whack. And, and so what levers can you pull? More hollows, more nectar, the occasional fire, and do what you can to get possums back into the landscape. Wow. Great. Thank you so much for that very thorough answer, Dave. Um, this is a question for Dave Eldridge. Um, Sue Bendel asks, how much longer does it take for leaf litter to break down in dirt rather than soil with good bryota? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, okay. That's a great question. I, I don't know. Um, it's probably two or three times longer. I mean, we haven't, what, what generally happens is that to measure decomposition, you have to put the leaves into a bag. So you imagine getting some fly screen mesh, you make a little pouch, you put the leaves in and you put it in the pit. We do the same thing on the soil. Um, but what happens is as soon as you put something on the soil in a bag, other soil will blow on top of it. So it never really stays on the soil. So it it, it breaks down pretty quickly, but the, 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 the it, it breaks down pretty quickly once it comes into contact with soil. Um, if it's on the soil, you'll get termites coming up through the bottom and, and eating it. But the, the big issue about, decomposition and litter in dry lands is the fact that we need to get it below the surface. It's no good on the surface because it'll break down with UV light and most of the carbon will be lost to the atmosphere. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, another question to you, Dave Eldridge from Paul with regards to soil disturbance. So he says, people often associate soil disturbance with weed invasion. Was there any evidence of this at your echidna field studies? Sorry. Um, sorry. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, many of you would might have noticed um, the depressions that kangaroos make under trees. When things get hot, the kangaroos climb under a tree and they build, dig what's called a hip hole. It's a kind of a depression. Um, we've been studying those as well and looking at how important they are. And after after rainfall, they just become a mass of weeds and things like uh, brassicas, wild brassicas and things like that. Um, <sighs> One of the questions I'm often asked is, okay, if we bring echidnas back or we bring bilbies back, are we gonna get a different suite of plants that were tied to bilbies and, or, or, bil, or echidnas or whatever? We've lost a lot of these ground disturbing animals and with them probably plants that co-evolved with them um, and we've lost the animals. And we so, so we tend now to get the species the plant species that occur in the general environment coming up in the pits. Sometimes they're weeds, sometimes they're not weeds. But um, yeah, we do we do sometimes get weeds coming up in these systems, but but generally not. Okay, um, and then Barry asks a question, um, which is I guess what is Australia's low carbon in the soil due to? Oh. Is, there, is there a reason for that? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, very little very little glaciation, hardly any glaciation in Australia. So glaciers are really important and tectonic, uh, you know, volcanism is really important for creating, for breaking down um, parent material, uh, sorry, parent material, breaking down rocks to create stuff like phosphorus. So for example, we have very low levels of carbon and very low levels of phosphorus because we haven't had much glacial activity. The second reason is that most of the soil in Australia has been deposited from elsewhere. Um, 
when Australia, when, when most of central Australia was underwater, there was this big uh, coastline called the Moravian Gulf. When sea level um, dropped, um, it, it, it exposed a whole lot of uh, calcium. And uh, during the Quaternary period, 18,000 years ago, we had this period of aridity. And a lot of that material was blown right across Australia, creating all those sand dunes, which are um, so... So a lot of our nutrients have been deposited from, our soils have been deposited from somewhere else. The carbon's been winnowed out. And because we don't have a lot of uh, glacial activity, we're not getting a lot of soil formation. Okay, great, thank you. Um, another one for you, Dave Ridge. Given, uh, this is from Cassia. Given that wild echidnas are foraging around ant nests, do you think the effects of natural echidna foraging would differ to effects from your experimental pits, which I guess aren't located on ant nests? Perhaps oh. the effect of pits is amplified when pits are combined with ant nests. Oh, that's a really interesting question. To be honest, I have no idea. But I would imagine that ant nests, um, well, we know that ant soils are more fertile. I mean, work we've done with a phenogaster, which is a funnel ant, has shown that the soil in those ants has more carbon and more phosphorus and more nitrogen. So I'd imagine that pits constructed in, um, in, in the vicinity of ant nests would actually be more enriched in nutrients than those that are constructed uh, somewhere that's where there's not an ant nest. The interesting thing in woodlands is, and I'm sure it happens in northern Victoria as well, is that you really can't dig a hole anywhere without coming across some termites or some ants. And so pretty much the whole system has got either termites or ants. And so there will be some residual effect of the activity of those invertebrates anyway. But yeah, I, I, th that's a really good question. Okay. Um, Dave Watson, you sort of touched on this in your previous answer. Um, but Jennifer Roland asks specifically when um, mistletoe is overwhelming trees in stressed environments, um, it, should they be reduced basically to help? Yeah, sure. I get this question a fair bit, and yes, um, but so I've got no problem with um, with with removing mistletoes from trees. If you've got a tree on your property that is a significant tree for you, your dad planted it. It's the it's your favourite tree. It's where your stock hang out. Fine, um, get in there. Um, you can shoot them off. You can get a, a cherry picker in. Um, just understand that that, that uh, to go back to my previous answer um, that they're telling you something. That if there's a lot of mistletoes in that tree or in a couple of trees, that's telling you something's out of whack. So yes, as a short-term solution, go ahead, remove them. Um, but you're not dealing with the underlying mechanisms and they will come back. I mean, I'm, I'm looking outside my window. I'm, I'm, I'm at uh, Charles Sturt here on campus and there's a big tree in the car park and grounds crew come through every two or three years and snip off mistletoes from that tree uh, i no longer try and tell them not to because i know that they'll come back in two or three years it's right back where it was before um so yes you can remove it um but uh and, and you can relocate them i mean and i've, I've talked to, to graziers about this and they know that so angus cattle love eating grass that grows up from fallen mistletoes it's apparently much sweeter so if you've got parts of the property your veggie garden that where you want more nutrients Chuck the mistletoes there, and you'll get you'll get a boost of uh, of growth. Okay, great. Um, Dave Eldridge, this is a follow up question um, with regards to rabbits. Would um, what is the is there any potential benefits from rabbit digging? Oh, that's a great question. And actually, we have I had a student uh, doing some work on that, and showed that um, you don't get the same effect from a pit dug by a rabbit than you would from a pit dug by a bilby or an echidna? And I think the answer is quite simple and it's about the structure of the pit. Rabbits tend to dig a very shallow pit with an inclined surface, almost like a triangle. Echidnas dig a pit that's like a, a bowl. Bilbies dig a pit that's like a cylinder. Uh, and those pits hang around for a lot longer, but the longevity of rabbit pits is very short. Um, rabbits also tend to defecate in the pits, uh, in the, the scrapings that they make. Um, and there could be a microbial aspect to this as well. Uh, there could be microbes that echidnas and bilbies are carrying with them when they are foraging. And those microbes could have some effect on the nutrient levels or the, pro the propensity for these pits to accumulate nutrients. But but we don't know. We, we, we tried getting... Um, 
microbial swabs from the snout of a bilby once at Scotia and it was very, very difficult and we couldn't, um, uh, the, the microbes were inviable when we got back to the lab. So um, it's an interesting question, but no rabbits, you know, rabbits are not doing, r rabbit digging is not giving us the same positive effect that the digging of other animals would. Maybe it does in, in where rabbits come from in Europe. I don't know, it's be an interesting question. Okay, perfect. And then um, talking about, I guess, the practical solutions, um, Paul again asks, um, are there practical ways of boosting the abundance of widespread ecological entities such as echidnas uh, and thereby contribute to the improved soil and hydrology at a landscape scale? Oh, I wish I had the answer to that. You know, this is, um, it's the management implications. The science is pretty obvious. It, they're good things to have and they're part of the toolbox, the woodland toolbox, but how do we enhance them? And I mean, all the sorts of things that Dave Watson's been talking about, about messy systems, about connectivity, about leaving, don't flog the log um, by leaving large trees. All those things are going to help to sustain these important ecosystem engineers, not just, not just vertebrates, but all the invertebrate engineers as well. Um, it's it's not as simple as just going out and digging a whole bunch of holes. These things are all interconnected. And I wish I had the answer, Sophie, but but I don't. That's okay. Didn't expect you to have a perfect answer. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> um, and then, so Dave Watson, so um, our colleague Cameron, who for anyone here doesn't realise, Cameron O'Mara is our Heathcote Local to Landscape um, Facilitator. There he is. Give us a wave, Cam. Um, Cam was just talking about the fact that many species are seen as more charismatic um, than insects and therefore pull more funding. Um, but obviously there is a big problem in the insect decline. Um, how, how do we make this issue more salient to, to people? Yes, this is, um, I guess, I'll, I don't have the right degrees to answer this. I'm not a marketer. I'm not a spin doctor. I don't claim to know how <laughs> like politicians think, if they actually do think. Um, I... I guess my approach is to be a bit sneaky and I know that I'm never going to convince my parents that cockroaches or that weevils are worthy, but they love robins. I mean, a red capped robin, I mean, come on, what's not to love. So I think focusing on insectivores um, and sort of uh, twisting the narrative a little so that you can't have robins without litter bugs. And I, I saw the language I use is careful um, and I think acknowledging that for whatever reason, feathered things resonate much more with people um, mm. than critters with multiple legs uh, and legs you can't count and eyes, you can't really see and they're so shifty. Um, so I think insectivores, insectivores, um, woodland birds, songbirds, robin redbreasts, that kind of language I think resonates more. But I guess the, the, the broader question you're asking, um, you know, how do you get people to care about the bush about about native animals about wildlife generally um i lose sleep over this i don't know and i'm and I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here i know i mean you you're all here because you care so how do we get your neighbor how do you get the kmart shopper to to engage with this stuff i don't know i don't have a magic i don't have a magic uh um, solution to this um but that's one of the reasons why i do this sort of stuff while i'm active on social media is to be just banging that drum and championing the amazing native uh plants the gorgeous wildlife that we've got and just reminding people not to take it for granted and that just little decisions you can make as a consumer and as a landholder whether your land is a is a balcony on a on a high rise or a little pocket handkerchief garden there's little things you can do that, that are going to look after the locals yeah absolutely I think we would all agree with that. Um, and then just one last, I guess this is more of a comment. Um, Lisa asks that, well, Lisa says it's a pity there's a direct conflict between the importance of litter as well as it's as fire prevention, uh, removing finer fuels. Do you have a, a comment on that, Dave? Yeah, this is this is tricky territory. Um, and I guess <clears throat> uh, yeah, fire, fire is a devastating thing, uh, as we've all seen recently. Um, and I've, I've had friends, I've had colleagues, uh, family who've lost, who've lost everything to, 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 to fire. So I, I, I tread carefully uh, in this space. Um, but I think we do know a fair bit now about fire behaviour and fuels. And what we're seeing with these catastrophic fires, it's far less 
um, about 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 ground cover, about fuel load, about you know twigs on the ground, and more about these ridiculously hot, windy conditions. Uh, and during those conditions, soil will burn. Uh, a friend of mine in Coonabarabran who lost her property, um, it was that hot that it burned the mortar out of the brick walls. Her house became a pile of red bricks. Um, so in those conditions, um, you know, everything burns. The soil burns. Uh, so I think th th there needs to be sense here. Uh, um, and, and sure, cleaning up around properties understanding the infrastructure around around farms fences um they cost money they need to be looked after um but there's ways there's ways of managing um uh uh you know bushy areas that you're not going to just have this 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 bare earth and a few trees and call that fire you know bushfire safe because we know that even that will 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 get burned to a crisp on those terrible hot you know north wind days but i don't have a magic solution there and it's something i worry about yeah, I think, uh, again, I think we can all agree with that as well. Mm. Okay, um, we've we've come to the end of our of our session. Uh, I just want to thank both Professor Dave Eldridge and Professor Dave Watson um, for your contribution to today. It's been really fantastic seeing both of your keynotes and hearing your perspective on things. Um, yeah, um, so we've got a we've got another session for everyone else starting at 1pm. So we have a little bit of a lunch break now. Um, so please feel free to join us um, at one o'clock for the next session and we'll sign off here for now. Thank you again. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.